And thank you everyone for attending. This is our first CWEA certification orientation webinar. So today we're going to give you an overview of the technical certification program and the steps that you will need to take to become certified. So keep in mind that this is a pilot and as such, we'll be sending you a short survey at the end um, and we would really appreciate your feedback on this. And also like Alec mentioned, we have plenty of time at the end to address your questions. So go, feel free to type them into the box at any time. So here are today's presenters, um, Tony Pirandini. He's the TCP Executive Committee Chair. You wanna say hello, Tony? Hello, hello everyone. <laughs> I'm Nora Duffy, Certification Manager on CWEA staff. And I'm Lydia Garris, Certification Assistant Manager also on CWEA staff. Okay, so what exactly is professional certification? It's a voluntary process where you are evaluated against predetermined standards for knowledge, skills, and abilities. So what this means is when you become certified, CWA attests that you possess the basic competency in your field that is required to perform the essential duties of your job safely and effectively. So why is this important? Well, it provides a lot of benefits for employers. Um, it gives them documentation that their employees have demonstrated a certain level of job-related knowledge. It provides a level of insurance that employees have safe work practices. It gives evidence for the public that the agency is staffed with competent employees. And all of this combined can increase the overall competitive position for an employer. So more importantly, what are the benefits for you? Certification shows that you've made a commitment to lifelong learning. It gives you proof that you've demonstrated competency and met the predetermined standards in your field. It can increase your earning potential. Uh, some agencies offer financial incentives for holding certification or it's needed for a promotion. And it gives you a competitive edge over others in your field. Also, as the certificate holder, you own that certificate and it can increase your mobility as you can take it with you to other jobs. So Tony's gonna talk a little bit about his experience with certification. As I mentioned, he is our executive committee chair. He is a certified grade four lab analyst and he also holds a grade two in environmental compliance inspection. All right, I'll try to keep this a, a little bit brief here, but um, just uh, I can tell you how a little bit how it what uh, kind of reinforced what Nora just said. Uh, for me, I first became a grade one lab analyst in 1985 not thinking much of it. I just wanted to kind of prove that I knew something. Um, uh, but uh, I worked in the private lab field at the time, but as, uh, as uh, what I found out was is uh, in the private lab field, a lot of people, uh, the certification wasn't the desire, the, own, the owners of the companies weren't, didn't really support them, but I continued getting my grade two and my grade three, and it actually helped me get a job in the public sector uh, nine years after I, uh, took the first test and um, it's actually helped me from a mobility standpoint I wouldn't have probably gotten the job I have today if uh, I worked for the city of Vacaville if I hadn't had my grade three lab analyst certification back then so uh, and it also um, what I find is the certification um, helps with uh, there's other people in our field that have that same certification and you own it and it's something that uh, you can be proud of that you say, hey, I know what I'm doing and I can prove it uh, with this, this certification. And there are other people in the field who can do the same and it helps you identify other people you can network with. So uh, for me, it's, it's really helped me move in my career. I started out as a, just a basic lab technician and now I'm a manager uh, for, at the city of Axville. And if I hadn't had this certification opportunities, I probably uh, would have uh, stayed at the line level. So uh, I would uh, definitely recommend that uh, that this certification has value. And uh, and I think that's enough, enough I could say at this point. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Tony. So now we're just going to do a quick poll. We just want to get an idea of who out there, what is your motivation for pursuing certification? Is it a requirement for your current job? Is it required for a promotion? Do you want to be eligible for a pay increase? Or is it something that you're just seeking on your own? Let's 
give you another couple of seconds here. Okay, so it looks like about half of you are pursuing certification for your own professional development. Closely followed by required for current job. Great. Okay, so here are the final results. Okay. So, sounds like you all are want to get certified, it sounds great to you, but the reason we're here today is you may be unsure what your next steps are. So we're here to make sure you have a solid understanding of your path to certification. So we'll cover the basic steps, including submitting your application, developing a study plan, what to expect on test day, and how to maintain your certificate once you've earned it. So here to talk about the application process is Lydia Guerra. So I'm going to hand it over to her. Hi, everyone. I will be going over the specifics of the application process. The first step in submitting an application is to see which exam you qualify for based on your education and experience. This chart gives the minimum requirements to be approved for each grade level. There is no experience required to submit a grade one application, as you can see here. But, for example, if you were interested in taking a grade 3 exam and currently hold a grade 2 certification in the same vocation, you would only need four full-time years of experience. If you did not hold a grade 2 in the same vocation, you would need to have six years of experience. Now that you know what grade level you want to test for, it is time to fill out your application. You can submit your application at any time. Be sure that you do not apply until you meet the minimum qualifications or your application will not be approved. When submitting your application, be sure to include detailed descriptions of your job experience. The more descriptive you are with your job duties, the more likely your application will be approved. If you are applying for a grade 2 or higher, be sure to have your current supervisor sign the application and make sure to sign your name on the last page of the application as well. Include any Include any supporting documents, such as a copy of your degree or transcripts. And if you do plan to test for multiple certifications, please submit one application per vocation. And as an important reminder, your name on your application must match your ID. Please don't use any nicknames on your application or you will be turned down by the test center on the day of your appointment. We don't want that to happen. Be sure to select your test window which they are located at the top of the application right here. So let's take a closer look at our four testing windows. Although we do accept applications on a rolling basis, you must submit your application by the application deadline for the window you want to test in. Here are four deadlines, August 31st, November 30th, February 28th, and May 31st. We do not accept any applications once the deadline has passed. Pick a test window that fits your schedule. Don't worry if something changes or you need to, more time to prepare. You do have the option to transfer once you have been approved. And this is the approval notification email you will receive once your application has been reviewed and approved. This email does contain steps on how to schedule your exam appointment. This email also includes your CWEA ID, which is listed here. You will need this number when calling or going online to schedule your appointment. Make sure you read through this approval notification carefully because it does contain a lot of important information, such as information on how to transfer your, from your current testing window, pre-approved calculators that you can bring with you to your appointment, and even a link to download study guides. I say the easiest way to schedule your exam appointment is online at this website. Um, this is the Pearson View website. You can create an account if you don't already have one, and you will need your CWEA, CWEA ID from the approval notification email when you do create that account. Once you are logged into your account, you can schedule, reschedule, and cancel exam appointments. 
As a reminder, you will only be able to schedule your exam in your approved window. So for example, if you are in the fall window, you will only be able to test in October, November, or December. So Pearson View does have many test centers conveniently located throughout the U.S. They will automatically generate the nearest test centers to you using the address listed on your account. But if you did want to take the test in a different location, you can do so by searching in the search bar and different areas will come up for you. Be sure to book your appointment early because appointments do book up fast, especially if you try to wait until the end of the window, you might not get an appointment. Once an, oh, sorry. Once an appointment has been scheduled, you will receive a confirmation email. This is only if you are doing it online. If you do not receive an email from Pearson View, your appointment was not scheduled. So now I'm going to hand it back over to Nora and she will discuss how to prepare for your exam. Great. All right, so this topic is probably the most important to many of you that are out there today. We get a lot of questions here in the state office about how one should prepare for the exam. Um, I'm gonna lead you through the basic steps to developing a study plan today. So every vocation has certain knowledge, skills, and abilities that are necessary to perform the job. These are known as the KSAs, and they're the predetermined standards that you're going to be assessed in. So the first step, um, these KSAs are identified by subject matter experts in the field. So all of the questions on the exam are developed from the KSAs. So you can think about any question you're seeing on the exam is going to be related to one of these KSAs in some way. It's important to note that the purpose of certification is to assess your current knowledge, skills, and abilities. So it's not to demonstrate mastery of a specific class, a course, or material, like an exam that you might take at the end of a, of a course or a class. Um, but that does not mean that you can't study to improve your chance of passing, but it may be a different approach to studying than you're used to. So the first step to creating your study plan will be to assess your current knowledge, skills, and abilities. This is gonna be your baseline. And so how you do this is using our KSA gap analysis chart. So this will list all of the KSAs for your exam, and it'll lead you through a self-assessment based on how often you do those tasks in your current job. So do you do it all the time? Do you have limited experience with it? Or you never do it at all? The purpose of this is to identify your knowledge gaps. So if you selected never do this for a KSA, then that's a definite gap in knowledge that you'll want to target with your studying. If you select limited experience, that's a probable gap and you'll want to focus in that area as well. And when you've completed the assessment, take a look at it as a whole. If you've selected mostly limited experience and never do this, you may want to consider applying for a lower grade level first. So your next step will be to bridge those knowledge gaps. Once you've identified them, you want to seek out training in those areas so that you can grow and learn. Um, I like to point out that it's important to study what you don't know, not what you know. This may seem like common sense, but a lot of candidates are more comfortable in the areas that they're already familiar with and they like to study and focus there, but you should really be um, pushing yourself to study the areas where you have limited to no experience. So this is another way to think about it. Um, Oops. Where did that slide go? Sorry, folks. So current knowledge here, this is where you are when you do the self-assessment. Um, the goal would be to get your target knowledge here on test day. So the way you want to think about bridging that gap is through training. So a great resource for training is the study guides. They're available for download on the CWEA bookstore and they are free for members. The study guides are a very important tool for preparing for your exam, but it's important to understand how to use it effectively. So some of the things that are contained in each study guide. It has all of the important program and policy information for the certification program. It contains a detailed explanation of the KSAs, which I'll give you a look at in the next slide. It has a list of recommended references, 
these are the primary references that were used to build the exam, so they're important to study. If required in your exam, it will contain a formula sheet. This will be the same formula sheet that's provided to you during the test. There will be a glossary of important terms and a few sample questions. So here's an excerpt from the study guide. You'll notice that the KSA is at the top along with the weighting, which is the percentage of the exam that's focused on this KSA. The general competencies will give you more specific information about each KSA so you can really familiarize yourself with it. If there are any specific math competencies that are associated with this particular KSA, they'll be listed here. And there's also the suggested reading. So note that the suggested reading section is included for your convenience and it will try to point you to the most direct area for that KSA. But note that they may not align with the latest editions and it's your responsibility as the test taker to be studying from the latest editions. So a few notes on what the study guide does not contain. It's important to point out that it does not provide instructional content it's meant to help you focus your studying and help you find resources for learning. Um, but remember, as a professional certification assesses your current knowledge, skills, and abilities, um, that knowledge is meant to be gained through experience. So we do not teach exam content, but we do provide the study guide as a tool so that motivated candidates that need to close specific knowledge gaps can seek out the training that they need. Another note on the sample questions. The study guide does not contain a full practice exam. These sample questions are provided to help familiarize applicants with the format of the test um, and to show a few examples of the types of multiple choice questions that can be developed from the KSAs. But it's important to point out that these questions are not written by the same people, the same subject matter experts that developed the test, and they're not meant to be representative of the exam. Um, so when you find yourself in the exam, don't ask yourself, was this question in the study guide? Ask yourself, can I relate this question to one of the KSAs? And another note that the study guide does not contain every available source of knowledge on the KSAs. So remember, there are lots of other places where you can find information and don't be afraid to branch out from the study guide. Another great place to look for training is on the CWEA events website. There are a lot of training opportunities through CWEA. You can search for training events relevant to your vocation on the website. Our local sections host a variety of trainings throughout the state, including some certification study sessions. Um, so while some events are specifically geared towards those that are studying for certification, there is, um, if there's a training that looks relevant to one of the KSAs for your exam, that's still a great way to prepare. Any training or educational opportunity that covers material related to the KSAs is relevant and it'll help you prepare for the exam. Um, so a note on this, if you can't find a session near you, I know it's a struggle for some that are in a lower volume vocation, such as biosolids. Um, you can try to put together a study group, uh, contact your local section. That's a great way to learn and a lot of candidates find that really helpful. So if you're still feeling like you need help, I suggest that you find a mentor. You can ask a supervisor, a coworker, or someone at your local section to mentor you. Lots of our experienced members that hold grade three or four certifications like to share what they know and they're happy to help. Um, we have a culture of learning in CWEA and you can ask them how they prepared. You can ask them for help with a technical question. Um, a tip I like to give is if that if your mentor is a really busy person, ask if they would make their email available to you and then that way you can reach out when you have specific questions. And Tony, did you have I anything it, to add? Yeah, just uh, one thing to add is uh, I, I know a lot of local sections have committees and uh, like uh, the Rebel Empire section has a laboratory committee and a P3S committee and a Young Professionals committee and that's a good way uh, um, to they meet regularly and they uh, really help reinforce uh, a lot of the work we do and you can learn a lot from other people who do the same work you do. So I would search out a local committee. Great. OK, 
Okay, so we did carve out some time here to stop and answer any specific questions about developing a study plan. Alec, are there, have you identified any questions? Let's see. Yeah, um, and we're, we're also answering them in the chat window. If, if you haven't opened that window, if there's a little orange arrow there on the right that'll expand the chat and Q&A. Here's the first one. Do you accept degrees from for-profit colleges? We accept degrees from any college. Um, it would need to be accredited, but as long as your degree is related to your vocation, then you can use that as qualifying education. Great. Um, this may have been answered, but uh, in regards to the study guides, will there be any recommended references inside the guides or other study resources? Yes, so there is a full list of references within each study guide, as well as if there are applicable references to specific KSAs, they'll be listed under that KSA on that page. So we give you a Great. full list at the end, as well as try to point you as close as we can to that specific reference for the KSAs. Great. Tony, did you mention something about the Office of Water at Sac State? Yeah, I would look. Uh, you can look it up on the internet, Office of Water Programs, and they have uh, an extensive program, uh, different different disciplines, and it's a great resource for uh, for manuals. They even have their own um, courses that you can take and pass, and and that they show that you know certain knowledge. So I would, it's one of the programs that I've used a lot in my career. Great. Um, Nora, again on the study guide, when it says there are no references available, where did the uh, where did the subject matter experts get the questions? Well, I would I can't say specifically where in that situation, but it would we do source each answer for the test, um, but it also relies on the sort of collective knowledge of the subject matter experts. So when we're building the exam, that's why we we reach out and we recruit volunteers from across the state that are high level in their field and then we bring them together to write those questions. Um, and if there is if there is a specific source, then we document that. And if it's appropriate, we provide that reference in the study guide. Yeah, and a good chance to remind you too can be a subject matter expert. <laughs> exactly. Just let Nora know once you get your grade three or four, Nora. Yeah. Okay, and you can you can write exams. All right, uh, Lydia, a couple for you. Um, yes. Let's see. Actually, they're coming in. My screen is moving on me quite quickly. So, Lydia, a couple for you. If exams are failed, what is the maximum number of times you can take a test within a one-year time period? Asks Matthew. So if you fail a test, so for example, if you are taking your test in this July through September window, you will have to skip a window, meaning you'll skip October, November, December, and you'll be eligible again to test in the February, January through March window. And then if you were to fail that one again, you would have to skip the next adjacent window again, and you'll be able to test in July again. So it's, it's like two times you could test in a year? Yeah. 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 Two times. That sounds right. All right. Uh, also, Lydia Gary is asking, how long does it take to get your exam results? Um, it takes to about two weeks to get your exam results. Uh, we get your results the next day, and we will send out results, yeah, usually two weeks, within a week or two. And we're, we're also going to cover that in the upcoming section, what to expect on test day. You'll actually get the results, whether you pass or fail, right at the end of your test in the moment, but then it takes another week or two for us to mail you out the certificate or your official results from CWEA. Great. Um, yep, they're, they're coming faster. Just a couple more here. <laughs> Another one, Lydia. Let's see, I just had it. Um, so Susan would like to know, what if you keep passing the exam? Um, is there a time period you have to wait after passing the exam from one grade to the next? So there is no time period that you would have to wait if you pass your grade two um, in this window, you could take your grade three the next window, and if you pass your grade three that window, you could go ahead and take your four. 
you know, going on, but you do have to have the experience required to apply. If you do not have the experience, you won't be approved to take that exam. But if you hold the, the grade level directly underneath, then you will qualify faster. Yes, you would have to have held it for two years, and then you would need less experience. And you can jump grades as we, I mean, it's important to emphasize if you have the experience based on the chart, you can see which grade level you can um, take. You can. Um, the only thing we caution against with that is jumping straight to the grade four. Um, even if you have, and Tony could speak to this as well, but if you have a lot of experience in your field um, or in your specific job, you may not have that broad enough experience um, to go straight to the four, especially if you've never taken the exam before and you don't have any familiarity with it. But people do I'll do it. But, I'll just second what you just said. <laughs> yeah. I don't recommend it. I recommend taking at least one test at a lower grade before you take the grade four. So you have a feel for how the exam works and everything because the type of, you know, the, as chances are, you'll uh, there's a much higher chance of not passing the grade for you, taking it without taking a previous exam. Get your feet wet at a lower grade. So Brian has a similar question. Um, I'm not sure who can take this. So if you fail, can you apply for a lower grade to take the test in the next window instead of waiting, uh, waiting yes. out the window? Yes, you can. So if you take the grade two and you fail it in the next window, you want to take the grade one, you could go ahead and do that. Just submit a retest application and you'll be able to take it. Yeah, and as Nora said, that's right. We're going to get into that. All right. Let me see. Um, any others? Well, we can move on into what to expect on test day, and then we'll leave plenty of time at the end um, for those of you that want to stay online, and we'll answer as many questions as we can then. Okay, so what to expect on test day. I know many people experience test anxiety, and one of the best ways to deal with that is to be prepared and to know what to expect when you walk into that test center. So firstly, you will have three hours to complete the exam. So if you're worried about time, don't be. The average test taker finishes in around two hours, give or take, depending on the grade level. Um, so you'll have plenty of time. A note for people that may have a disability and that may require you to have more time to take the exam. If that's the case for you, there is a place on the application um, for you to note this. And if you, sub you know, submit the supporting documentation, uh, we'll work with you to set up an appropriate accommodation for your test center. And each exam is around 100 questions, um, give or take. So just keep that in mind as well. So here's the inside of a Pearson View test center. Keep in mind that not all the test centers are the same. Um, there are many throughout the state. Some are in colleges. Some are um, Pearson View corporate centers. So it just depends on where you book your exam. But this is going to be the basic setup. Um, it's important to note that if you experience any technical difficulties of any kind or have any problems or complaints about the test center, you must notify the proctor immediately um, in the moment. So this is very rare. Pearson View has a very high standard for their test centers, but occasionally, you know, we'll have someone complain that their center was loud or they thought they had a computer issue. Um, you do agree to Pearson View's testing policies before you sit the exam. And it does require you to notify them. And the purpose for this is so that they can document it, um, which gives us somewhere to start when we're investigating your claim. Um, so here's the proctor here. And these are the different testing stations. You'll notice like um, headphones are available if, it, if you don't like the typing noises. Um, and as for the computer screen, here is a, shot, a screenshot of what the actual exam looks like. Um, so, show you the various features here. This will be the name of your test. It'll show you the time remaining up here in the corner and which question you're on. And it gives you the option to flag any question to leave a comment if you'd like to leave us some feedback. Or you can flag an item to review and this will allow you to revisit that question at the end of your test. This button here will let you access your formula sheet 
it'll pop up in a second window. And there's also the on-screen calculators are available here. And here's your basic multiple choice question and your answer options. So just a side note on the exam questions, they're all in multiple choice format. And keep in mind that you're instructed to pick the best answer based on the information presented in the question. So not necessarily what you do in your job, but based on the information presented to you, what is the best option? Also, if you'd like to get more familiarity with the computer system, you can take a short demo on Pearson View's website. So you'll see this option when you create your online account through Pearson View. And here's just a quick look at the on-screen calculator so that it's nothing new to you when you go into the test center. You will have the option of scientific or regular, um, or as Lydia mentioned, there are allowable physical calculators. So as long as your calculator is on that list, you're welcome to bring it with you to the exam. You're also given a personal whiteboard and a marker, and you can use this for notes and scratch paper. So you will receive your test results right away once you finish passing your tests. So you're not going to have to wait to find out if you pass. But what if the unthinkable happens? As with any exam, there is a chance that you might fail. So in this case, you'll want to pay careful attention to your full score report that's given to you at the end of the exam. Um, so look at those, look at the breakdown of your performance in each KSA and ask yourself some questions. So were there some clear areas where you could improve? Do you think this was the right grade level for you? Do you already hold the grade level below? So if you ask yourself these questions and you determine that yes, you do wanna take another shot at the exam, then you'll simply submit a one page retest application. So as we mentioned before, you must skip a test window before you can retest. Uh, this will allow you valuable time to study. And just keep in mind, use that score report and use it to help you target your training even further and remember that your lowest scored area is gonna be your best opportunity for improvement. And I always like to remind people to just keep a growth mindset. As Tony always says, if you focus on growing and learning in your career, certification will follow. So I'm gonna hand it back to Lydia. She's gonna take us through the last section, which is how to maintain your certificate once you've earned it. Okay guys, so I'm going to go over the last topic and give a few details on maintaining your certification once you pass your exam. So you will get your certificate in the mail, uh, your certificate and blue card in the mail within two weeks after you pass. The certificate, which is here, will have your name, the vocation you are certified in, and the expiration date. In case you do forget your expiration date, you can always go to your certificate as a reminder. The blue card does contain a little cutout right here to carry with you. This small card can fit in your wallet and you should keep your blue card with you at all times to show proof that you are certified. This whole blue card sheet also does contain brief information on how to keep your certification current and it does have a few online training courses that you can um, sign up for. So you will need to renew your certificate, certificate annually. Um, as a reminder, a renewal notice is sent in the mail three months prior to your expiration date. Make sure to keep your contact info up to date or your renewal reminder or certificate may be sent to the wrong mailing address. And you will need to submit 12 hours of continuing education, also known as contact hours, every two years. Earning contact hours demonstrates continued competency, which adds value to your certificate. Keep in mind that you cannot start earning contact hours until you pass your exam. Now you're probably wondering, well, what counts for contact hours? Any in-house training offered through your employer, such as a tailgate safety meeting, will count. Um, any CWEA educational events, like attending our annual conference, can also count or any instruction, instructional activity related to your vocation with proper documentation. Um, you'll be able to find a, a bunch of online trainings that make it easy to earn these hours at your own pace. Um, and if you are ever unsure of what trainings or courses would be approved, you can always give us a call. This is our website. You can create an account at any time. It is important to create an account 
because you will have access to a bunch of information, such as keeping up with your membership. It would have the date that your membership expires, the date that your certification expires, and when your contact hours are due. And it would also have uh, information on the contact hours you have submitted versus how many are still due. This is also a way to update your contact information, your mailing address, uh, phone number, email address, just so you know that you are getting those renewal notifications and making sure that your certificate is being sent to the right place. So if you ever have any questions, we are always here to support you. Uh, you can go ahead and give us a call. This number, this will reach to our member service team and if you wanted to speak to anyone in certification, just go ahead and let them know and they will transfer you over. And this is the certification email address. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up to any questions that you have. We'll go ahead and answer yeah, so, some. Yeah, we left a lot of time at the end since this is our first one. We wanted to make sure we had plenty of time to address your questions. Um, so for those of you that need to sign off, thank you for attending. Um, I hope you found the webinar useful and relevant. Um, and please, if you could um, answer that survey, that'll be really valuable for us to hold future webinars. And so for now, we're going to spend some more time just answering individual questions. And good luck to everyone on your exam. OK, great. So let's see. There are a bunch in here. And there are more pouring in. All right. So Randy would like to know, how do we find a mentor? Is there like a list of experts on the CWA website of suggested candidates? Tony, do you want to talk about mentors? <laughs> well, the uh, first thing I would do is uh, take a look at what, uh, where you're at, where you reside in your local section. Uh, the people who are leading your local section, you can go to the CWA website, and there's a local sections link. Click on that, and you can find the local section in your area. And uh, usually, it'll uh, you click on their website, and it will show who's uh, the chair and vice chair and whatever the section. You can contact someone in your local section, and they can link you up with many people, and that they'll know the people who are locally in your area that can help you out. So that's what I, that's I think a great resource for CWA having the local section support. I agree. I think the local section is a great place to start, um, as well as possibly your supervisor or someone at your current job. Um, if your employer is supporting you in pursuing certification, you know you could um, ask if they could suggest someone um, to mentor you. And you could become a part of the local section when you sign up for membership. Um, you could either be a part of one local section that is nearest to you or a few that are close to you. There's also a, a resource available on our website, mycwea.org. That's your private login. As, as Nora mentioned it, you can go in and see your contact hours. But in the left-hand menu is something called contacts and then member directory. So if you hear the name of someone who's really good at this, um, you know, down in Southern California, William Cassidy's really good at the mechanical technician uh, exam, and Roy Reynolds is as well. If you hear their name but don't have their contact, go into My CWA, log in, on the left menu go to Contacts, and then Member Directory, you can look up all 10,000 CWA members. It'll give you their email and their phone number. You can do a reach out to them. We're, we're, all, we're mostly all friendly people in this industry, really interested in helping each other out, so don't be shy asking for help. Okay. And one other thought that occurred to me is uh, our training conferences. If you want to meet the people who are, uh, there's a lot of good networking going on that, at these conferences where you can meet up with other people. They're the, most of the leaders are at these conferences and most of the mentors will be there. So I, they're a good time to, if you want to meet somebody or if you want to get some help, I find the training conferences are really good for, for networking. Okay, Nora, uh, another experience or actually educational question. Alfred would like to know, how do you determine the related field or courses for an associate's degree? Yeah, so this is a great question and it applies just in general to the qualifying education experience. So we recommend that you be as detailed and possible as possible in filling out your application. Um, and ultimately, these determinations are made by subject matter experts. So if we're looking at your associate's degree 
and it's not clearly related to your vocation, we'll send that to a subject matter expert um, and they will review the KSAs for the exam you're applying for, look at the associate's degree, and if they determine that your experience um, will help, you know, is enough to help you be successful for that exam and that you qualify, then we'll go ahead and qualify you. Okay, and just to add to that, as a lab, uh, I'm a lab uh, subject matter expert, and um, I look for uh, your transcripts uh, to see what courses that were taken. And so if you've taken certain courses, then you would qualify. And if you hadn't taken, say, a chemistry or biology course, you'd probably not qualify. Yeah, so in some cases, we may request additional information from you. Okay, this is, this is a specific one about preparing for the ECI, Environmental Compliance Grade 1. Thomas is reviewing the 1996 edition of the pretreatment facility inspection. Um, how would I know if there is a more current one? I don't know if Susan, if Susan Highstand knows or Alina knows. So you could email us after the webinar and I can reach out to some ECI folks and, tr and some subject matter experts and, and check this for you because offhand I'm not entirely sure. Um, but like I said, you want to be always using the most current versions um, if you can or just using what's in the study guide. Okay. Let's see. Elizabeth pointed out, also check with vocation related committee. We do have a collection system committee. We have an O&M committee. You're going for the MEC tech. Those are a large group of people that can help you out as mentors. Mm -hmm. Jacob, I don't understand your question. Jacob Morello, um, what 5S, if you could retype that question, please. Um, those folks asking about training classes for individual exams, we'll send that info to you directly. Um, try to find where those study sessions are going to be and, and send you that directly. So Kurt asks, does CWA have an agency membership? Kirk, right now we don't, but we do work with a lot of agencies and we're looking into more ways we can um, help them through the processes of getting people certified. Right now it's, it's mostly a research project. So I see an important question here. How often do CWEA study guides get updated? I believe some of the ECI tests got updated, but not the other study guides. So Ben, to answer your question, we revalidate and update all of our exams and study guides on a regular schedule. So it depends on how much the field has changed. So what we'll do for the revalidation process is we gather together subject matter experts in the field. They'll review. Um, all of what the current job is, how it's changed. They'll look at the exams and we'll make a determination on what level of, of updating is necessary. Um, but we do do it on a regular schedule for each of the exams. And then to answer Corey's question, um, do you have to put in those 12 hours two years before you pass your test. So you are only required to turn in contact hours once you pass your exam. So for example, if you pass your exam this month, you could start earning contact hours in the beginning of August. And you would have to keep getting those hours every two years. So Nora, J Jacob appears to be asking, what is the percentage pass rate for each of the exams? Do you want to just give some general examples? You know, it really differs. There's, there's a big difference between, um, you know, the grade ones to the grade fours throughout all the vocations. And there's also a really big difference in the volume of test takers. So the pass rates will vary based on if it's something like collection systems where we have hundreds of people taking the exam each year, or if it's something more specialized um, like environmental compliance grade four, where we'll maybe have six people test a year. Um, but in general, our pass rates usually converge around 50 to 70%. And it also depends, um, there's some variances within the vocation. So 
In particular, environmental compliance and lab tend to be some of the most difficult exams because they cover a really broad knowledge base. So to answer Sanu's question, um, says they want to get a Lab 1 certification. They're starting out new as a career in the wastewater industry. Are there any study sessions in the East Bay? Um, so just a note on the grade one, it will test you at the level of competency for one year of experience in the wastewater field, but there's actually no experience required to apply. Um, but for study sessions that would be recommended, I would recommend checking with the local section, searching the events website, and also um, the CSU Sacramento course may be good for you as well. Michael Smith, to answer your question about if you should go for a grade two versus a grade one. So since you hold a bachelor's, in, um, you will only need one full-time year of experience. So if you have been a lab tech for a year, you will be okay to apply for a grade two. Uh, William Cassidy, you're asking what is the passing score? Is it a 70 for the exams? To answer that question, there is a different passing score for each exam. So that is something that is determined in the exam development process. Um, by the SMEs, so part of the process of developing an exam is they will go through and look at the overall difficulty and determine the passing score for that particular exam form. So even within one vocation and one grade level, like say we have multiple exam forms for collection systems grade two, each of those exam forms can have a different passing score because they might be at different slightly different levels of difficulty. Uh, Nora and Tony, I don't, I don't know if we covered this, but Ben has a good question. He's heard the ECI, the Environmental Compliance Exam, has been updated, but not the study guides. But do you want to announce all the improvements you've made in that exam category? Yeah, so all of the ECI exams, we did just complete um, their revalidation cycle, like I mentioned earlier. And as part of that process, the study guides were updated. Um, however, we are looking into those study guides a little more um, based on feedback from the ECI community, uh, we might make a few more minor tweaks to the study guides um, because we feel that it may help people prepare better. And the, a lot of the, the things that we've been discussing around that are things that we covered in the webinar today, just not relying too heavily on the practice questions, um, not taking them as a full practice exam. Um, yeah, that's really the big one. And in the, it's good to understand the universe of CWA. So again, this is the pre-treatment committee. Um, Nora mentioned committees don't, don't get to run exams or write study guides. That's within our, under Tony's committee and, um, and our, our certification staff. And then a different division helps these committees. But you can see that the chair of the P3S committee went to um, the previous chair of the sec technical certification and said, hey, we want to redo these exams. And the uh, technical certification uh, committee um, uh, listened to their concerns. Uh, anything else you want to add about that communication, Tony? Well, it's, it, this is common for um, all the disciplines out there that, or vocations. Uh, like Eleanor had mentioned earlier, uh, information changes, our, our, our work changes over time, and the ones that change more often, we update more often. And the ECI in particular had um, had some uh, community had come back and said that it needed to be revised, and so that's why we, why we made that a priority last year. And so uh, we hope that, uh, with, that um, there should be a big improvement in particular with the ECI exam. And, um, but that's all I have. We pretty much have to say on that topic. Exactly. So I'm seeing a few more questions about people searching for specific study events um, for their vocation and grade level. So that's something that's offered through the local section. It's separate from the state office. We do have the tool of the events website for you to search. 
Um, but if you can't find what you're looking for, then we suggest that you reach out to the local sections in your area and ask if they have anything um, planned or that they're planning. So this would be a good time, last call for questions, and then I, I Nora, Lydia, turn it over to you to wrap up. I do not see any more questions. Okay, great. Oh wait, one more just came through. Just came in. Are there particular areas in the wastewater industry that have a shortage of people? Alec, you want to answer this one? I can. Thanks, Randy. So yeah, a group called Baywork and uh, some of the Southern California agencies we've been talking about, like the City of Los Angeles and LA County Sa Sanitation, actually have very high red alerts for the categories of mechanics, electrical and instrumentation technicians, so those programmers who run the SCADA systems and troubleshoot those, and industrial electricians, electricians dealing with um, you know, the high voltages in the large systems. If you know somebody who's a mechanic, auto mechanics, truck mechanics can, can kind of make, or farm equipment mechanics can, can kind of make the jump, we have the certification mech tech and can help them get started. Um, electricians, I think our industry faces a tough competition with all the construction that's going on. Um, but if you want to be an electrician, you'll be in high demand. And SCADA, we're facing competition from programmers, basically. And the districts are, are concerned about how we will attract uh, instrumentation folks to our sector. Please share the website with friends and family that you know that want a great career, nice, stable, good pay and benefits. And that's the, a joint website we run with several associations. It's called cawaterjobs.org and uh, encourage people to get involved. Uh, taking a certification can be a good way into this sector. Also, taking a tour of a wastewater plant is a great way to, to get started. So that, that would be the, the three areas that I would say. Great. And that was ca.waterjobs.org, right? Correct. Okay, and that in. All right, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I hope that we met our goal of clarifying this process for you and giving you the confidence you need to seek out certification and get studying. Just keep in mind that if you ever have any other questions along the way, we're always here in the state office. Um, so feel free to use that contact information and reach out to us. Um, so if you find yourself having any questions in the next couple of days, couple of weeks, um, please follow up with us and we'll do our best to help you out. So good luck with your careers and with your certification goals. Thank you.